I want to start off, I try to start off with somebody else's writing, and I've been reading a lot of Russian poets lately. So, Mayakovsky, of course. Uh, yeah, wow. So, uh, this one is to his beloved self. The author dedicates these lines. <clears throat> Four winds, heavy as a blow, unto Caesar, unto God. But where can a man like me bury his head? Where is there shelter for me? If I were as small as the great ocean, I tiptoe on the waves and woo the moon like the tide. Where shall I find a beloved? A beloved like me. She would be too big for the tiny sky. Oh, to be poor like a multi-millionaire. What's money to the soul? In it dwells the insatiable thief. The gold of all the Californias will never satisfy the rapacious horde of my lusts. Oh, to be tongue-tied like Dante or Petrarch. I kindle my soul for one love alone. In verse, I command her to burn to ash. And if my words and my love were a triumphal arch, then grandly all the heroines of love through the ages would pass through it, leaving no trace. Oh, were I as quiet as thunder, then I would whine and fold earth's aged hermitage in my shuddering embrace. If to its full power I used my vast voice, the comets would bring their burning hands and plunge headlong in anguish. With my eyes raised, I gnaw the night. If I were, oh, as dull as the sun, why should I want to feed with my radiance the earth's lean lap? I shall go by dragging my burden of love. In what delirious and ailing night was I sired by Goliath's I so large and so unwanted. That was 1960. Okay. Um, I'm going to read some new stuff, some old stuff. First one's kind of a prose poem. I've never read this before, so. <clears throat> the home I will build for you. Let me tell you of the home I will build for you, my love. I, I will build you a fine home where the front door is made of laughter, and when you knock on the door, it giggles and asks the knocker to stop knocking, because being a door made of laughter it tends to be ticklish, and it would be greatly appreciated if they, the knocker, would be so disposed as to use the door. Once inside our home, the visitors will be inclined to notice the special wallpaper that runs down the length of the west-facing hallway. This is a very rare wallpaper that I have had to travel far and wide to find it, it being made of butterflies. Every visitor will attempt to get closer to look at the patterns of this paper, and as their curious noses get closer, the butterflies will become startled as being held to the paper only by whispers of love, they will take flight. Then all of a sudden, the front room of our home will be swarming with butterflies of so many colors, like flying flowers from a botanist illustrated book. Can you see it, love? Once the flutterers stop fluttering, our visitors will find their way into the main room, which is centered on a large dining room table with a menagerie of chairs encircling it and a large kitchen. The table is large, so large, there's a coin-operated telescope at one end. Most visitors will be startled when pressing their eye into the eyepiece that they are able to see their long-lost loves smiling and dancing around the table. At the other end, there will be another coin-operated telescope, this one looking back. Everyone will be astonished when they see their younger selves looking back at them. Now let me describe the chair at the head of the table. This chair will be made by a peculiar craftsman that I found living in the village of Algeria. It will be made from the light of the setting sun that set in the city of Skipta on a certain day when joy was especially prevalent. We will need to invent special spectacles so that the ornate designs that will have carved into the sun chair by the smiles of summer children playing in the sea refusing to come home when they're called by their parents can be appreciated without squinting. The chair at the other end of the table will be made, of course, as you know, from the moonlight that cast shadows across our faces that night we first met, 
That same moon that all the flying fish tried to coax closer to the sea with their aerial acrobatics and their daring feats of flying that made you go, ah. Now to the chairs sitting on either side of the table, these I will make of worn stone that they will borrow from country fireplaces, those stones that have been polished smooth by generations of stories about love and adventure. Those stones that warmed every imagination till the last ember popped and closed its eyes, tired as the rest of the family. And then there will be the kitchen. Here will be the hearth and hearth of our home, where the cabinets will be made of the same material as the front door, they being cousins, and of course, if you, as you've always said, what kitchen is worth its salt without laughter? I see you wrestling, wrestling a hot wind back under a pot, since our stove will work by winds. Zealous zephyrs from Greece and solicitous Rocco's from the Saharan sands and the veggies out of Libya, their mischievous name, mischievousness not always appreciated when they're supposed to be warming with butter. You will smile and fling the little zephyrs under the pan. You are the queen of the home I will build for you. While you cook for a myriad of guests, I will show them the rest of our home. I will show them the room that is just for old umbrellas and the room that's just for birds home. I will show them the library filled with our writing and with low voices singing love and stories never heard before and where angels will chase each other among the folios. I will show them the attic made of glass so that in the end, all of life's secrets will be revealed. <clears throat> We'll show them our bedroom and they will be impressed by the soft and billing bed I have made for us from our night's dreaming and our love sighs and of course the headboard will also too be made from the same material as the door and the cabinets and they will delight in its random laughter. From our room to the spare bedroom, this room will be well welcoming to anyone who wants to stay over, even with the small cloud sulking in the corner. I will tell our guests about the rules of our home where inappropriate use of thunder and lightning from a small cloud indoors is never allowed, especially thunder and lightning that is meant only to torment the cats. Young clouds are in need of appropriate timeouts from time to time. Oh, the home I will build for you and the room we will build for our child. This room cannot be described, my love, because there are no words in any language to describe this room. I have looked in odd and diverse encyclopedias corresponding with architects of mysterious buildings and dark women of letters, and to no avail. Let it be as the Gypsy King has said. Let music, not words, describe the beauty that this room will be. Can you hear it, my love? Lastly, I will build our garden. Many will be impressed with the fountains and the peacocks whose hundred eyes with their feathers will tell the future of our guests, and by the fireflies and hummingbirds that will chase each other around the yard, the yard will be filled with the sound of small chimes, each flown around by a dragonfly, and the tinkling caused by their constant play of near misses and roofs of dairy. And this, this will only be possible because of you, my love, and your patience for the hummingbirds and fireflies and dragonflies will eventually, only after much deliberation, still always do what you ask them. Many will be speechless and will not know what to say when they visit our home, the home I will build for you, and even less will they understand that this is not just a home, but it's my portrait of you. Okay, a few others. Some of these are rough. We're playing with them, seeing how they feel, so. Istanbul, I must leave you, because the night cranks through your dark streets, mechanical, and the, and the night is dragging itself, and it sparks, and its sparks are only approximation of the stars, and yet everyone's fields start to burn. Even my field is aflame with the books that they have written or have yet to be written. And tonight the hills have an eerie glow of war, while the inside and the outside of your walls argue jealous of the other. I'm tired of all this. Istanbul, I must leave you. Hurry, I must pack my shadows of my shirt. My words have become palsy, only an approximation of language. I must leave before my words fail me. Look, the empty dark sky. Even the moon has left as a stowaway to the sea. Mm. 
This one's called Terminal. Flight 230 taxis slowly down the runway. You are wanting, are wanting for things, checking them off like the list children make before Christmas. You want the things you can't have, for things to be as they were, or for things to be different, or for the progression of cells to reverse, or just maybe for the laws of physics to be repealed. Even if just for a day, so you could open the airplane window and catch a cloud in a jar for her. Like when she was small and she sat in the seat next to you, smiling, holding everything you could have ever wanted in an empty blue. Blue so the cloud will feel at home, she tells you. Glass jar on her lap. Everything could just be the way it was. Yeah. <clears throat> Sins of the Fathers. I am on a train in winter, leaving Krakow, just having stolen my grandfather the rabbi's silver beard. A young woman sits on the bench across from me. She smiles at me as if she knows what I've done. So I weave his beard into a small child who sits very still next to me so a draft makes him sway. My breath fogs the window. Everything is so white I can't make anything out except my grandfather looking into the old mirror, rubbing the stubble on his face, not recognizing himself. A certain man. A certain man builds a great love around a certain woman. It is a great expanse, a garden, a field of songbirds and bells. In the center of the great love, the man builds a house for her. She walks into the house where she sees the man's chair, a winged chair, large wings that stir the air gently and rustles telegrams spread on the floor sent to her in haste. She calls out to him, and her echo returns, carrying a nervous smile. The man is in the fields. He has dreamt for her, each blade ringing. Now he is tending the garden. Now he is weaving words into the wind to describe his love for the woman. Now he is sleeping against the garden wall, dreaming of her. Now he is dividing the secrets of fire in the stag's moan. And she calls to him. She calls out his name. And her voice returns, returns to her, thinner, thinner than when it left. <clears throat> Here's a brand new one, two brand new ones actually. Abandon, for Sveta. Two epigrams. The torment of caution often exceeds the dangers to be avoided. It is sometimes better to abandon oneself to destiny. Napoleon Bonaparte. Once one path is chosen, the other must be abandoned forever. Anna Boris Nolava Godin. We unhook the stars from the sky and throw them at each other, laughing, chasing each other across the heavens. We make up the rules as we go, like the gods before us abandoning everything till we are bare. We count down to zero and begin from nothing to make the life before the dream and the dream the life. From here, we share each other's portion of infinity and rename the days, you, I, we, them. No, no, we rename them eyes, lips, cheek, hands, heart, soul, live. And our counting has already passed a thousand days, and our counting has passed a thousand joyful kisses, and our counting has passed a thousand sleepless nights. While all those who counted on us are left behind. Right. And together in our abandon, we watch the innumerable falling stars and listen to the blood course beneath each other's skin, surging with such necessity. This one's titled Caught. I am caught deep in the lie of her, in the naked, in the vulnerable, in the lengthening out of her. Caught in a tangle in the thicket, caught by the full moon between the shadow and the shade. 
under deliberate constellations, or like the comet spending eternities in the dark till caught by light cast, rushing giddy towards the sun, its tail throwing silver like the lover when his prodigal bride returns, or caught like the stag with horns wedged between two trees, till spring green and wild flowers leap from the now white-rimmed, astonished eye. Okay, a couple more. I will draw two ravens. <clears throat> One. My life is a love letter home caught in a dust devil spitting wildly. My hopes have been mistreated by the waitress with a bad hip. Our loves wear us out until we are born again in our weariness. That's when I saw you dancing in the laundromat and called you out. Two. If you open your dress, I will draw two ravens on your breast and a hundred psalms on your belly. If you wear me, wear me passionate. In the space where we love, sparrows have nested. The tide has risen. How many stars swirl at your small feet? Three. Your body is water quivering from my bad breath. Your eyes are two roads that ask to be traveled. Your hair hangs down for me to climb back home and I will weave new mornings from the strands you leave behind. Four, the moon has stopped to watch us and dangles her feet above the water where we swim. She rises slowly above us looking back while the night gathers up all the dreams of all those dreaming into bouquets as we drift half awake, half innocent, our nakedness a boat gently rocking. Fine. Breathe in, breathe out, now be still with me, my love. Let our faces pressed together be the evidence of all the beautiful things to come, so that in our gaze, fate will be helpless, and the birds I have drawn on your two perfect breasts will abandon the ground forever. looked in dresser drawers, in closets, in hidden compartments of lentils, in the sideways glance of old mirrors, or in the creak of old stairs, in search of you. I walk in and out of so many rooms, some empty, others filled with dreams that are not mine. I stand under a black umbrella in the falling rain, tracing my desire for you. At night, I read dusty books and longing for you, or sit on porches or stoops, and then try to make out your face in the shapes of clouds. I have sent posts to random addresses that I steal from pay phone, phone books, write you long letters about quote quotidian days and the frustrations of burnt toast. And then I stomp while waiting in the rain for an empty train and build a fire in the midst of my longing and study the long migration of birds and the theories of chance and learn to close my eyes and to dance instead of tremble from the music that comes from the wound in my side. Learn to walk light-hearted among the dead, those wanting so desperately to send love letters to anyone who read them, surrendering myself to the orbits of portentous stars and to wonder and wondering, is it you? <laughs> Last one, Sepulveda. <clears throat> I would have you hold me again, but I'm frightened. The water fills the shower ankle deep, and when I was small, I swore it was possible to go down the drain, and nothing she said would ever convince me that it was otherwise. I need to move away from here. 
My dog has become anxious, and there are gunshots every night, and I swear she's dreaming of chasing the bus that you left on. She whimpers so loud that the star Sirius has started to complain. I close my eyes and try to count to ten, but I can never make it past six because I'm worried that when I close my eyes, the North Star is looking for a way out. I would hold you again, but I'm uneasy. I'm uneasy like that muggy August night when I saw a coyote sulking and wet under a streetlight on Sepulveda Boulevard. It was strange. No one was out. So strange, you can't believe it. But I shake all the time.